Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Beyond all else, an AA meeting is a time of gratitude. Only today, I received a box of flowers. It was shipped from Honolulu. But it really came from an AA who is alone in a distant Pacific outpost. You and I know that that was his expression of gratitude for his deliverance. And yes, it it was more. To him and to us, it was a symbol of our wonderful world community. Yes, a meeting time for gratitude, for our deliverance, and for all who have aided us in that. And we think right away of those near and dear. I was happy to remember the Lord, for she is a symbol of all those who have come after us. And then there are the many friends, non-alcoholic friends, who have been indispensable in the gathering of this society. One of them is here tonight. One of the oldest and dearest friends we have, Frank Ann. Ah, yes, there are many, sir. An AA meeting is not only a time of gratitude for great big things and great big principles, it is a time for gratitude for other things, perhaps just to say. I know everybody here must have been greatly moved by the fact that those fellows from the Musicians Union, just having played a grueling assignment this afternoon, came straight from that assignment without any supper to create an atmosphere for us in which this meeting could be set. Yes. It is a time for gratitude. For 15 years, you and I have watched a great building under construction. To us, it is something more than a building. It is a temple, a veritable cathedral of the Spirit, in which more than 100,000 of us now stand, knowing of freedom and a brotherhood and a sisterhood, the like of which we could have never dreamed in other days. Such is our cathedral of the Spirit. Now approaching completion in its main outline that men call A.A. It might well serve our purpose. If figuratively speaking, I now took each of you in by the hand, and I conduct you back into that cave from which a friend and I emerged through a very narrow opening 15 years ago, 
and walked hesitatingly along quite a blind trail, which opened into a winding path that came down through our infancy and broadened to a road that led through adolescence and now opened on the broad highway where we are now about to take our destiny by its hand. And as we take that journey, let us pause every now and then to note those times and places in which there were great hours of realization and great hours of decision which so deeply affected our destiny. That will set a background suitable, I hope, for what we are about to do tonight. Speaking of hours of realization and decision, your first one respecting AA was just the same as mine. Mine came on a summer day in 1934 when I lay upstairs in the drunk tank on Central Park West in New York. I'd been there many times before, but this time it was different. By now I was acquainted with the gravity of my malady. I knew I was possessed of an obsession that condemned me to go on drinking a physical sensitivity which would ensure madness. That's that stuff. I knew I had no power to go on living. And such has been the realization of every alcoholic here. And it is well expressed in the first step of our program. The first step toward freedom being the realization of our own power. Such is the divine power of God upon which this society is built. Downstairs, another one shared this same hopelessness. That was law. She was talking to the doctor. She was asking the doctor the very same question that you wives and husbands of alcoholics out there have asked. She was saying, Bill is a man of great willpower, great persistence, great obstinacy. For two or three years, Doctor, I'm sure he has wanted to stop above all else. What has happened to his willpower? Why, oh why, Doctor, can't he stop? And the good man came back with the answer we so well know. Gentle soul he was. He had to tell Lord that I was indeed Possessed of a power greater than myself. Indeed, I was obsessed by the tyrant Barlow. And she said, as you have said, well, how serious is this, doctor? And the good man, Dr. Silkworth, a medical saint, if ever there is to be one, Hesitatingly told. I thought Bill might be an exception to most of those who come this way. One of those rare exceptions. But now I'm afraid it isn't going to be so. I'm afraid, Mrs. Wilson, you will have to lock him up somewhere. Else he will lose his mind. And perhaps more. His life. So we alcoholics have no monopoly on hopelessness. It certainly has been a shared experience among us. 
Then came a realization to somebody else. And his decision. Three months later, a friend, himself an alcoholic, heard of the straits in which I was. He decided to come and see me. Because he had experienced a relief from his obsession, his spiritual need. I hadn't seen him in a good many years. I was drinking in the kitchen. I had now become a lone drinker, no longer daring to go in the street, or the police would get me. The erstwhile great provider of Wall Street time was now being supported by his wife, Lois, working in his apartment. Here was my friend on the phone. I thought, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to talk with old Ebby again? We'll drink and we'll talk about the good old days. Ah, how significant that remark, the good old days. The only place the mind could go. For us, the present was unbearable. And there was to be no future. Yes, we talk about the good old days. So I mused over my gin while I waited. And suddenly he's in the doorway. I suspect we drunk her a little psychic. I saw right away that something had happened to him. Not only was he sober for the first time I had ever known him to be in New York, there was something different. He sat down at the table. I pushed over my crock of gin. I used to drink three bottles a day then. Put a little pineapple juice in it so Lois would think they were cocktails, you know. On being offered a drink, he said, no thanks. Oh, I said, come, Abby, what, what got into you? You on the water wagon? Oh, no, he said, I'm just not drinking. Well, I'm really puzzled. I say, come, come now. What, what's all this about? He looked at me with a half smile, and he said, I've got religion. Ah, what a sad blow. Got religion. <laughs> well, this was distressing. No doubt he had substituted religious insanity for alcoholic insanity. But one had to be polite, and I said, well, my dear boy, what kind of religion have you got? What brand is it? Oh, he said, I don't know. You really call it religion. It's just plenty of horse stance. group of people sold me on a lot of very simple ideas. None of them are new. Just why they've had such a terrific effect on me, I don't know, except one of the group himself was a drunk. And here are the ideas. I began to get honest with myself as I had never got honest before. I quit this hellish business of living alone, confided my defects to another. I made a list of the people I had harmed, and I visited them to set matters right so far as I could. I then was told of a kind of giving new to me. The kind of giving that demands no return in terms of economic reward or prestige or anything. The kind of giving that demands no return. I was told that if I tried to give of myself of others in such a mood that I might lose my life to find it. Now he said, uh, don't leave, Bill. He said, I know you. Religious outlook, zero. But he said in order to make these principles work, so far as my drinking was concerned, I found that I had to pray to whatever God there was. And to my great surprise, when I tried the experiment with an open mind, and remember the dying can be open-minded, when I tried that experiment, 
there he was. Maybe you don't like that idea. Oh, well, I thought to myself, here, it's going to be one of these evangelistic deals. Oh, there, he'll pour on the sweetness and light and the pressure for his stone. This is going to be distressing. But oh, no. My friend was proof. I've since learned that prudence is a great theological virtue, and you bet your life it was in my case. No. He merely said that he'd come to pay me a visit and pass on what he knew, what he had experienced, if I could make any use of it. And soon he was gone. How why? Well, I found that in no waking hour could I get the memory of my friend's face and what he had said out of my mind. Had he said anything new? No. Principles old as the hell. Nothing new had he said at all. I'd heard it all before. But he had described a condition that I sensed that he had. He said, you know, I'm not on the water wagon. I feel as though my problem had been taken from me. I feel all in one piece. I feel free. I feel released. And somehow I knew that was so. Well, I went on drinking for three or four weeks. And I came to the same conclusion that every alcoholic here has since come. And the conclusion was, who are beggars to be cheap? And if there is any such position as my friend says, I had better seek him out. So I thought to myself, well, I can't have one of these. Yet. Emotional conversion, you know, I'm a Vermont Yankee, they don't have that sort of thing up there. It's got to be an intellectual uh, business, you know. If, I, if I'm drunk when I'm converted, why, uh, it might not be the real thing. I better go get thoroughly sobered up and take another good hard look at this deal. So I start for the hospital. Well, you know how drunks are on the way to the hospital to be dried up for the last time. You always get drunk as a monkey, and so did I. So I came tottering into the hospital, waving a bottle. My old friend, the doctor, looked at me rather sadly, for he had had hope in my case. And I says, Doctor, this time I've got something. And he said, I'm afraid you have not boy. You better go upstairs and go to bed. So to bed I went. And because I had gone to the hospital early, I wasn't too, too badly off in three days' time. Free now of alcohol and sedatives, I was frightfully depressed. And behold, my friend stood in the door, very early one morning, long way uptown. I thought to myself, he does practice what he preaches. He should be looking for work this morning. Then again, I feared that evangelism a little bit, I thought. But no, my friend is still more prudent. He waits for me to ask him what the conditions of that relief had been. Oh, yeah, he said. Oh, well, you get honest with yourself, Phil. I mean honest. Go for it. You talk it out with somebody else, in confidence, confession, if you want to call it. I suppose the word will gripe you. You make restitution to pay for your damage. You try to do something for somebody with no gimme to it. And you pray as best you can. And that's all there was to it in my case. Again, he's gone. And my depression deepened. And at last, I hit the bottom of the pit. And I suddenly found that I had become a child, alone, and crying in the dark. For a parent who did not seem to be there. 
And then I said, well, now I will do anything. Just like that cancer patient. I will do anything for a cure. And then in no hope at all, really, I cried out, and if there is a God, let him show himself. And then came a realization in Jesus. The greatest one in my whole life. There can never be another light. It seemed to me that that place lit up in the blinding glare. I was transported into an ecstasy. And I suddenly realized that I was free. And utterly lost in this strange state. In the mind's eye, I seemed to be on a mountain, and a great wind was blowing. And I perceived at once that it was not of air. It was the wind of heaven, the wind of the Spirit. And I was free. At length, I find myself on the bed. But now I lie in another world. And a great peace settled over me. I felt at one with the universe. And I thought to myself, so this is the God of the creature. Well, all of you here have had that experience. Don't say no. For every AA here has, so has his family or more. That very experience, excepting it wasn't so bad in most cases. What came to me in minutes has come to most of you in weeks or months or in years. But it is that awareness that there is one on whom we can depend. There is that awareness which has come to all of us that we are now enabled to do that which we could not do before on our own time. Such is the awareness of the consciousness of God, which descends on every member of this society, which stands in our cathedral of service sooner or later. Well, to me, this has come with such mysterious power, yet on such utterly simple terms. Of course, I thought, as you would have thought, why every alcoholic should be able to find an experience like this. And then I questioned myself and said, well, why didn't these truths hit me this way before? Why, of course, one alcoholic is talking to another. He must have struck me deep. He must have deflated me way down and made room for the grace of God that was forever blocked by my own raging ego. The ability to live in my world, the ability to transmit to me, the ability to humble me where no other living one that was one alcoholic talking to other, to another. Maybe that was the clue. Well, in my place, you would have started to work frantically with other alcoholics. And I did. As many of you have since done. Nearly all of you, in fact, as this vast gathering speaks. I work with these others. I tell them of this sudden experience, which incidentally spoke, down in New York is called by the cynical Bill Wilson Hot Flash. Well, the drunks in those early days weren't a damn bit impressed with that hot flash business. They all tapped their heads and said, no. So I worked and I worked and I worked. Well, you know what the defect was. I had become a preacher. I was talking off a moral hilltop. For with this experience came 
a liability, a certain spiritual pride, a conceit. You know, I fancied I was divinely appointed to fix up all the drunks in the world. But boy, oh boy, how the drunks knocked that out of me. Not one success in six months. About this time, Lois's relatives began to murmur, when is this guy going to stop being a missionary and go back to work? So under that gentle prodding, I used to go over to Wall Street, where I once had been, and I sat around on chairs in brokerage shops, and that made it look to folks like I was working. And one day, I'm sitting uh, beside a stranger. We fall into a conversation. And you know how things can snowball in the streets. All of a sudden, it runs into a deal. And very suddenly, I'm in the midst of a proxy row. And all of a sudden, I find that I have a controlling interest in a little company. And it looks like they're going to elect me president of a little company out in Akron, Ohio. All rolled up in a matter of few weeks as a result of a conversation with a stranger. Oh, on what slender threads this destiny of ours has often gone. So I'm in Akron. Now I'm going to be elected president of the company. Now we're going to be respectful. We'll hold up our heads in this community. And when I get the economic situation fixed up, then maybe I'll work some more with these drunks. And we'll get Lois out of that damned apartment store. Those were my thoughts. This new crowd threw their proxies on the table, but they didn't have enough, so I wasn't present. They took off in the general direction of New York, leaving me broke in the hotel lobby, the Mayflower at Akron. Ah, well, you know, you drunk, what happened. Waves of anger and self-pity. Fierce anger, too, because I suspected that those proxies had been forged. And suddenly I realize I'm in danger of getting drunk. And I panic. And alternately I was looking in the bar. It was a Saturday afternoon. That familiar buzz was rising in there. I thought maybe I could scrape an acquaintance, drink a glass of ginger ale. Oh, there started the old rationalization train. But this time I had been restored to sanity. I spotted that, that typical train of rationalizations, and I said, hey, look out, you're going to get drunk, you're going to get drunk. What shall I do? Then came another realization. Oh, those other alcoholics, none of them had sobered up. But how often had my anger and my tension and my self-pity disappeared when I had tried to work with them, even without success? Yes, I could lose my life to find it the life of another. And then I saw that for my own protection, I needed another alcoholic as much as he needed me. And that was a basic realization. And I sought one out. And you know that prodigious chain of circumstance, which could have been nothing but providential, which brought me face to face with Dr. Bob and dear Ann in the living room of a non-alcoholic one who, of a great crowd of people, the only one, who seemed to have time enough and who seemed to care enough to bring that meeting about. And I told Dr. Bob about alcoholism and malady, of my own experience of drinking, of my release, and frankly, of my present peril. And I told him how much I needed and then I think we had begun to get the essentials up. For something passed between us, I guess. Something happened. I think AA began right there, on that June day in 1935. For you see, my first friend had tasted these fruits but briefly. His obsession returned. He fell by the wayside. And he's never quite risen yet, though I believe he will. So there was Dr. Bob. And there was I, in Akron in the summer of 1935. Annie Smith 
prudent lady that she was, said to me, Bill, wouldn't you like to come to our house and live a little while? You know, you could keep an eye on Bob, and he could keep an eye on you. Maybe you could revive that business deal. So I went into that house. That place, which to me, is Howard. And I lived there. And soon Dr. Bob said to me, uh, Bill, uh, just as a matter of self-protection, old Dean, uh, don't you think we'd better be doing some work with Trump, and we'd better get a move on? So that looks all right, uh, let's do it. Meanwhile, I'd been fussing around with a lawsuit. So he called up the city hospital, where he had been tossed off the staff. He calls for the nurse in the receiving ward. He tells her that he and the friends from New York thought they had a cure for alcoholism. And said the rather exasperated nurse, think you got a cure for alcoholism. Doctor, why in heaven's name don't you try it on yourself? <laughs> well, he said, a part of the cure is working with other drunks, and we're looking for a drunk to work on. Well, the nurse said, well, we got a dandy. They just wheeled him in here in the ambulance. He's got the DT. Used to be a well-known attorney here in town, member of the city council. But he's got so bad that in the last six months he's been in here four times. And he can't even get out of here and home without getting drunk. He's in a bad way. He's raving. He's blacked the eyes of one of the nurses and knocked her down. And now we've got him strapped. How would that one suit you, doctor? Well, Smithy said, that sounds pretty good, nurse. Uh, put him to bed, and here's his medication, and we'll be around when he gets cleared up a little. So presently, Dr. Bob and I saw a sight that tens of thousands of us have since beheld, and God willing, hundreds of thousands of us will still behold. You know what it is. Sight of the man on the bed who does not yet know that he's dead one. So there was the man on the bed. We explained our mission. Told him of our drinking experience. Told him what this malady was. Told him of our relief. And the man on the bed said, How long you been sober? Well, Bob's been sober a few weeks. I've been sober a few months. Well, he said, I was sober as long as that. Lots longer than that once. And besides, I'm a worse case than you guys. Ever hear that, Ron? <laughs> no, it's too late for me. I guess you guys have been through the ringer, but you're only in up to your hips. I'm in up to my neck. I don't dare go out of this place. No, boys, it's too late for me. Don't talk to me about religion. You know, funny thing is, said the man on the bed, I'm still a man of faith. I used to be a deacon in the church. But I guess God hasn't any faith in me. Well, we asked, could we come back tomorrow? Oh, sure, he said, do come. You understand. So on tomorrow, we came. And we saw a sight. Which all of you have since seen. You know about what it was. The man's wife was there, and she was saying to him, Why, husband, what's got into you? You seem so different. And he said, Yes, there they are. They are the ones who understand. And then excitedly he tells how during the night, somehow hope had come. And then when he abandoned himself to these simple precepts, there was that curious sense of lightness, that curious sense of being free. And something more than hope came. His hope had now grown into a mighty assurance. So that the man on the bed said, Please, wife, fetch my clothes. We are going to get up, get out of here. And AA number three rose from his bed. On that summer day in June 1935, 
and he hasn't had a drink since. And then there were two or three of us gathered together, you see, in that town, had an answer. And then, as since the promise of the good book has been fulfilled, that was the beginning of the first AA group. Though three years were to elapse before we realized that that had been the case. Chastened and more humble now and more experienced, I returned to New York and a little group took shape there. Dr. Bob continued work in Ashland. Briefly, I got back into Wall Street, but that collapsed again. Three years had passed. It's now the summer or the fall of 1937. And I'm in Akron again. Wall Street has folded up. I'm out of a job. Dr. Bob and I are talking again in the old living room there. And this time we're comparing notes. How many cases did he work on? How many cases did I work on? Oh, hundreds. But, more importantly, how many had been sober and for how long? And we cast up the list. And when we cast up the list, it suddenly burst upon us that enough time had elapsed on enough cases. So at length something was proved. Ah, a chain reaction might start, one alcoholic talking to another. Enough time elapsed on enough cases. Yes, that was it. And he and I clearly saw that new light which had begun to shine upon us children of the night. Ah, what an hour of realization that was. I wish you could have shared it with me. But that realization brought a vast responsibility. There were only a couple of score of us in both towns. The amount of failure that had been immense, the amount of labor great, how were we 40 people going to tell the million alcoholics in America who yet didn't know? Those who were still lying on these beds and might never know in time. How are we to transmit this thing? Well, by this time, you know, I'm an optimist and I often get drunk on other things than gin. And by this time, I had blown this up into my imagination so that even though we had but 40 cases, I began to talk, well, now, Bob, you know, this may be the beginning, one of the greatest medical and one of the greatest social and one of the greatest religious developments of all time. I began to talk like a circus barker already. Well, Smith, he said, now, slow down, you know, he's more conservative. Yes, but we must have some way of transmitting this. The hospitals don't like us. Why don't I go out now, I'm a, you know, a promoter, and we'll finance a string of these drunk tanks, kind of a chain of drunk hospitals, see? And then it's, uh, nobody but old-timers can put this thing over, so we got to go to the old-timers, get some dough from someplace, and put them out as missionaries. You know, they, ain't, they aren't all going to come to Akron or New York, all these million drunks. we got to get out those missionaries, we got to get out those hospitals. But above all... We've got to have a book. We've got to put it on paper, what's happened to what, what these principles are. And there have got to be testimonials in that book, case history. At least we owe that much to the million who don't know. And if we don't do this, the message may get garbled, and we may bust up into schisms and all sorts of troubles. Unless we have some kind of a standard book, the press may come in on us and ridicule us and call us a cult, and that would cost lives among the millions who don't get it. Yes, we'd have to have hospitals, we'd have to have missionaries, we'd have to have a book. And I told you last night about that historic meeting a few days later in a parlor in Akron. The Akron alcoholics were there, Smithy was there, I was there, and we urged these things upon those drunks. And I told you how those drunks broke up into three sections. 
there was the orthodox section that said, look, this will put us into business. This will put us into property management. This will create a professional class. You can't do this to us. And as for a book, we got along all right without a book. If we have a book, we'll quarrel what we put in it. Maybe it won't be right anyway. And we'll quarrel what about the money about that book and who's going to publish it. No, the strength of this thing is one drunk talking to another in those parlors. So said the orthodox section of that day. And then the promoters, well, you already know what they said. Just got to have books, got to have hospitals, got to have them. And the indifferent people, the people in the middle, who really decided the thing, said, well, we don't want to be bothered with any of this. What if Smithy and Bill think we got to have some dough? We think Bill had better go back to New York where there's a lot of it and get it up. So the indifferent, plus the promoters, outvoted the orthodox people at that time. But as later events showed us, the orthodox people were not all wrong. And I told you last night how Mr. Rockefeller, by giving him of himself but not of his money, saved this movement from professionalism and property ownership. But as you know, we did come up with books, the one from which the reading is done tonight, the core of which are those 12 principles, the early word of mouth program laid down in 12 concrete steps. Happily, those steps have been accepted by the world of medicine and by the world of religion and almost, you might say, by the world in general since that day. But when that book, that tiny chip, was launched on the world tide of alcoholism, None could then foresee what happened. You remember times were very tough. And the printer almost got the book. The sheriff moved in. We lost our house. Mr. Rockefeller gave us no money. We didn't hear from him for three years. And then things began to unfold. And Liberty Magazine published the piece. Some inquiries came in. We started to distribute them. Fall of 1939, a man came up to me only to say and said, I came in on that liberty piece. And you remember how in 1940, Mr. Rockefeller gave the dinner to all the rich men? We had about five billion in capital and bankers in the room, and we figured the time for the big touch was here, the money was coming in. Nothing of the sort happened. He gave of himself, but not of his money once more. But he stood up and publicly staked his reputation and placed his confidence on 800 anonymous drunks. What a vital contribution. What a realization and a decision on his part. How easily he could have unwittingly ruined us. Oh, yes. There have been many great realizations and many great decisions taken on this road which leads to our destiny. And they haven't all been taken by us. That was one of them. And damn few have been taken by me, too. I'll tell you that. I'm going to knock this inspired leadership idea right out of you in a minute. Anyhow, you know, the big payoff came when Jack Alexander's piece appeared in that Saturday post. And thousands upon thousands of inquiries from frantic drunk and their wives and relatives poured in on that little New York office. And that announced to the world that this thing was on the level and that the Saturday Post was saying so. As much as if to say, this is good, folks, come and get it. And how they did come and get it. Ah, you can remember. Remember that old-timers dinner we had only yesterday? All of the people there who came into the Los Angeles group at the time of the Post article. Well, right then and there, of course, we now see in retrospect that AA had come out of its infancy and had begun to enter its next phase. The 
phase of adolescence. Well, with us, adolescence was especially fearsome, exciting, and perilous. Ah. You see, it had been proved that the individual could stay all in one piece by these principles and by working with others. But now the test was, could these AA groups so rapidly forming stay in one piece? And we made the rather frightening discovery that just because drunks get sober, they don't necessarily get very good or very moral. They could still act like hell, and I don't mean maybe. They could be mean, they could be vindictive, they could gossip like the devil, they could strive for power and prestige, and they could push and shove each other around. Oh, yes, it was a wonderful society, and there was great joy in it, but that there, there was, though their mighty currents of dissolution were in there, too. And as these groups began to form all over the country with such rapidity, we were beset with terrific problems. And they began to write us in New York about these problems. What was the experience in those two or three older groups? And what problems they were? Well, you remember them. My Lord, I remember one of the first ones in New York was where the people who were getting out of the insane asylum. There was a cult in New York called the Cult of the Pure Alcoholic. Nothing the matter with them except they drink. So when we began to take people out of the nut factories, we were scared to death. We said, well, what would be sandbags? What will people think of this AA with lunatics coming in out of the asylum? Today, a half of the board of trustees of the Alcoholic Foundation are ex-asylum inmates. Figure that one out. So we lost that bit. Then there were queer people coming in. Now and then. Oh, we said our reputation, my God. Oh, we, we can't have, uh, we can't have people with other ailments. Well, you know and I know that some of those people have become our most respected and wonderful members. You and I look back with horror that we might have pushed them out into a blue. Oh, we no longer have those fears. Then came the panhandlers, and then came the prestige seekers, and then came the politicians, and then came those quarrels over property when we got into the club business. Oh, yes, the club business. A brand new set of problems. Boy meets girl in club. What next? Oh, appeared the big bad wolf and the little red riding hood. Dissolution was near at hand, we thought. And, as in old time, the rock throwers threw the rock to the women fell, I guess, sometimes. But they all got up again, didn't they? Ah, those were the days. The wonderful, fearsome days of our adolescence. And on those hot anvils of experience, we beat out the tradition of alcoholics and not. We egocentrics began to say, yes, the common welfare must come first. Unless we can hang together as groups and as a movement, there will be little survival for any of us and none for the million yet to come. The common welfare has to come first. And then in late years, we began to talk about something called the group conscience. And when the word was first mentioned, we old-timers said, the hell you say, the group conscience. They haven't got any conscience. Look at the way they've cut us up after what we, all the good we've done for them. All the good we've done for them, and look at how ungrateful these people are. Group conscience, what do you mean? Ah, today we know better. We know that when you get a, a, a great crowd of people clustered around these principles, that they do have a conscience, which is often much wiser about their own welfare than any inspired leadership. Oh, how well I remember my first experience with the group conscience. 
Times were pretty hard at Clinton Street, Brooklyn. The house was full of drunks. They were stewed most of the time. Lois was working in the damn department store. And one day I was up at old Charlie Towns who owned the drunk tank where I'd originally dried out. Charlie called me in his office. He said, look, Bill, he said, I want to talk to you. He said, old Doc Silkworth always had faith in this thing of yours. He said, I didn't. But he said, now I do. He said, I know, you only got 40, 50 members around here, but someday, my boy, we're going to fill Madison Square Garden with those drunks. I said, Doc, I used to think so, but I think you're a little imaginative. No, he said, I believe that. I said, look, Bill, these other drunks are getting drunk. You're passing them up over their head. They're going back to work. Drunks may be pretty crazy, but none of them are stupid. They can certainly earn money if they can stay sober. And you two people, you and Lois, you're starving to death. And as for the Rockefellers, what have they done? Now, look, Bill, why don't you come in here and let me give you an office here and make your headquarters and then you could get on my staff as a kind of a lay therapist, call it anything you like. It would be perfectly ethical. You know I haven't tried to take any advantage of the fact that you got well in this place. We haven't tried to capitalize on the fact that Dr. Silkworth's idea of sickness was a vital contribution to your society. Why don't you come in here and I'll put you on a darn good drawing account. I'll do more. Years ago in 1929, in the days of the stricken stockbrokers, when they all had bankrolls, this place used to make several thousand dollars a month, Bill. Today, we're just about breaking even. Times are hard. A partner of mine pulled out and took some of the business with him. But, Bill, if you'll come in here and make a perfectly ethical hookup with me, I'll give you a third interest. I must confess that I was terribly tempted. But the temptation passed into a conviction that Charlie Towns was right. And as I went home, I fell prey to our familiar ill. I fell prey to a rationalization, a particularly good one, because I got it right out of the Bible. I thought to myself, yes, Bill, the laborer is worthy of his hire. So I arrived home, and Lois, after an all-day stand in that department store, was home cooking supper for the drunks around the house. None of them were getting well, either. It was only the ones outside the house that got well. And I said, well, dear, we're going to eat. We're going to make this tie-up with Charlie Town. Well, she didn't seem too enthusiastic, but she did seem kind of nice. That night, there's that meeting in the parlor. And the drunks come in from around the neighborhood. Somewhere in Pudden, a very big meeting, a score of it there. And excitedly, I told them of this new opportunity. And as I talked, I saw their faces when I had finished, there was a dead silence. And finally, one of them spoke. And I now know that he spoke for the group conscience. He said, Bill, we know you and Lois are having a tough time. Maybe we can give you a lift. But he said, don't you know that if you tie this thing up to that particular hospital, that every hospital in the country will laugh because Charlie Towns is selling God? The old atheist. Don't you know, Bill, if you put yourself in that position that you'll become a professional? Bill, you can't do this thing to us, said the group conscience. No, you can't do this thing. So I listened to the group conscience for the first time. And I knew that it was right. And luckily, I had the grace to obey it. And at that moment, it flashed over to me 
You have never been a teacher of this society. You have been its pupil. And ever since, I have been I have tried to be a pupil of the experience of this society and to listen and listen to the conscience of this movement when I fear I am tempted. So much for the inspired leadership stuff. The box center, huh? Well, the rest of the tradition develops. You know, we thought we needed all this money. Today, the tradition says we don't take any contributions. We pay our own bills. I don't mind confessing we have a hell of a time paying our own bills. Of course, this society will earn a cool $600 million as a result of the combined earning power. Drunks are individually very generous, but collectively, I'm afraid we are as tight as the bark on a tree. You know, there's a funny story about that. The joke is on me, too, not on you. When we first asked for money to keep that central office open to answer all those Saturday Post inquiries, of course, the drunks were slow on the uptake and they didn't send in a half enough. We thought a dollar a year apiece would do the job. and Oh, I don't know, we got 25 cents a year apiece. It looked like we'd have to throw those inquiries in the wastebasket. So I just couldn't hire the help to answer I was raging up and down the office. All of a sudden, an old friend of mine, a slippy, uh, one of the Clinton Street failures, stood in the door, weaving slightly. And I knew right away he was in for a touch. Nevertheless, uh, I took him inside my little cubicle, and I said, Hi, my friend. I said, Gosh, it's terrible the way these drunks are. Stingy guys. He said, Well, what about a few bucks? I said, Sure. And I stuck my hand in my pocket, and I handed him a five-dollar bill. Well, at that time, my income was thirty dollars a week from that Rockefeller dinner money, you know, and that was all. In other words, I handed him five dollars to drink with that Lois needed for groceries. Why did I do that? To prove to myself how very generous I was, and by happy contrast with the other drunks, how stingy they were, you see. That very night, I went up to the club. The club was struggling along. The landlord was restless. The treasurer very bashfully brought up the su subject of money. Treasurers were very bashful in those days. And he said, he said, boys, now at this intermission, we're going to pass the hat, and can't you do a little something more? And I'm sitting on the stairs in the intermission trying to save some drunken soul. You know, I was always working at that. The hat came along by me. And I reached in my pocket, and I got a hold of a coin and pulled it out, I absentmindedly looked at it and saw it was 50 cents. And I reached in the pocket and I got another coin and I put it in the hat. And folks, what do you think it was? It was a dime. And then I woke up with a start and I said, so you're the guy who was panning all these dumps because they didn't send the buck a year. And you're the guy who gave five dollars to this bum to drink on. Ah, yes, when your arms could be seen, they were very generous at Lois's expense. But when you had to put it in the hat, and it was a collective responsibility, and there wasn't any romance in that random heat, romance in that heat and light stuff, then you turned just as tight as any of that Good lesson, that one. I'm passing it along. But we do obey principles. We must, if we would survive as individuals, and if we would survive as groups. So it was your experience and my experience that has generated these AA traditions. They are not laws, but they are a mighty force now being confirmed in our hearts and by our experience. And they had come so far along last summer that at our Cleveland convention, the first international one, 7,000 of us said, yes, this is the platform on which we wish to stand. This is at the point at which we have grown up. 
We have taken our destiny by the hand. And Dr. Bob was there for the last time. And we did that. And declared that this movement had grown up, had come of age. Such is my little account of our infancy and of our adolescence. At the outset of this meeting, we said, every AA meeting is a time for gratitude. Now, primarily, I think we AA express our gratitude by seeing that this message is carried to those who don't yet know that they want it. Therefore, the means by which in the future this movement is going to carry its message to those who don't know and to impart it to those coming in its door. In gratitude, we are going to provide whatever means that takes, aren't we? So that brings into the foreground of our thinking now, the final phase of this discussion which has to do with the subject of something we call services. These services, until recent years, have hardly been respectable. They were supposed to be kind of a necessary evil. The pious looked on them with considerable scorn. Some of them. But when you stop to think about it, AA has to be something more than recovery. It has to be something more than unity. If AA is anything, it is a program of action. It has to function. The drunk has to do something about those principles. His group has to do something about tradition. The area has to function as an area. We see the need for central service. The movement has to function as a whole. What makes it function? Service. I suppose the first great service ever performed our moment was performed by my doctor, a man of medicine, when he sobered me up repeatedly and finally told me that this thing was a disease. A great service and a great tradition of service now growing among our friends of medicine, the watch of alcoholics and on. Another service, by all odds, the most expensive one we have, and for aught I know, the most important one. But what about our wives? I can remember the time, the first time, that Lois Wilson and Annie Smith baked cake and brewed coffee for those drunks out there in the living room when this thing was still flying blind and no man knew who would be drunk next. Coffee and cake for the drunks in the living room. A service that helped AA to function. And then AA got too big for those living rooms. And the days of order simplicity were over. We had to move out into hall. We didn't want to mix money with AA, but the landlords didn't care anything about that. They wanted rent. So somebody had to pass a hand. And at first, it was somebody, it was anybody. The old-timers picked him out, and they paid the rent. But by and by, that somebody was elected. He became a treasurer. And then there was a chairman. He was the founder for a while, but by and by, they'd push him off, or he'd walk off. If he walked off, he was an elder statesman. If he was pushed off, he became a bleeding deacon. And the group began to have a little rotating committee that looked after the chores of the group. And in a big area like this, you found there were a few chores that had to be done centrally. Somebody had to answer the telephone when Alcoholics Anonymous was called. Somebody had to interview people who wanted to find out about it. Somebody had to make hospital arrangements. Somebody had to arrange meetings like this. Somebody had to arrange your dinners, this, that, and the other thing. Chores to be done for the area that couldn't be done for any group. So the idea of central service began to grow. And you had to hire a secretary or two. Oh, God, we groaned awfully about that, but we did it. And we're deeply realizing 
that those few chores must be done and well done. So, years ago, in anticipation of a need that this movement might have to have certain things done for the poll, you remember how I told you last night that we formed the Alcoholic Foundation, nothing but an incorporated committee of our first non-alcoholic friends and a few of us, and how at first the thing raised no money. In fact, it never raised much money except $3,000 a year for five years, and then we began to pay our own bills. And how the title to the book Alcoholics Anonymous was handed to those foundation trustees. And how then the management of our little office down there was handed to them. How you groups began to send in a little money to pay the bills in the office, bill handled by this board of trustees. Then we found out that no particular group or alcoholic should feel authorized to rush to a microphone or a newspaper or a magazine of national circulation and put out propaganda about AA. Our overall public relations got to be a problem. Gee whiz, I remember the first problem we had. There was a drunk down around Jacksonville, and he'd got one of these shouting religious experiences, kind of mixed up with the AA stuff, sobered him all right, and he prepared 13 lectures about Alcoholics Anonymous, in which he figured very prominently. And he put him out on the Jacksonville radio, and as a result of that, the drunk showed up and the group started. Well, very much heartened by this, he being the promoter type, like me, you know, he goes to one of the life insurance companies and said, we should tell this whole message to America as a public health firm. Well, actually, from the A point of view, the message really stunk. I mean, if the groups had ever heard it, they would have gone berserk. A lot of drunks would have been turned away. The guy meant well, but the stuff was awful. Well, he rolled up to the New York office and said, I just made a contract with the Mutual Broadcasting Company and Gulf Life Insurance Company to put on my 13 lectures, and here are the lectures. Boy, we read them there in the office, and our hair stood right on it. Did this mean that any drunk could rush to a microphone any place, any time? On a big national hookup? This stuff was junk. It would be awful. What could we do? So I remonstrated with him. I tried to be gentle. I tried to be prudent. But this guy was a promoter. And prudence ended when he wrote me and said, You, Bill, and your board of trustees can go plumb to hell. I owe this message to America. Well, that posed the issue. Didn't we have any control of those things at all? Were we going to be as simple as that? So I wrote him back and assured him that he had a right of free speech, but I feared that the groups might exercise their free speech, and when they told his sponsor what kind of a thing, uh, how what they thought about his program, the Gulf Life Insurance Company and the Mutual Broadcasting Company would get very ill indeed. So we didn't have that particular program, but at that point, I wrote the groups of that day and said, would you entrust your general public relations to those trustees down there and let, let us look after it. You look after your local public relations, but these big pieces, this broadcasting, this radio business, this magazine business, can't we centralize that? And you did. You authorized those trustees in New York to do those jobs for you. Let me show you how meaningful those jobs can be. Only a year ago this time, we received a script of a movie being prepared by one of the big companies here. A lot of nice folks in that company. They treated us fine one time earlier. Well, this was a kind of a sophisticated script. They meant all right as far as we were concerned, but it really didn't represent AA correctly. From our point of view, it was miles off the line. Well, now you people wouldn't have any idea of the trouble that your office down there and that board of trustees went to with respect to that script. An immense amount of correspondence back and forth. A.A.'s here in the movie business helped us out. We made an appeal to uh, the uh, what used to be the Hayes office. We had attorneys in it. We had one of the best agents in the business. And finally, the company obligingly changed the title 
and warp the thing around so that it doesn't look anywhere near so bad. Now, that was a long labor, completely unseen. But those are the kind of things that have made all the difference in the world. For example, if you picked up Fortune magazine, the last February number, you will find that that issue was devoted to the whole American scene. Politics, religion, the description of the sections, the history, capital, labor, economics. It was a panoramic picture of America as it is today. And of all the societies that Fortune might have picked out to cite as a typical and unique American institution, who should Fortune magazine pick but alcoholics or not? And if you get that February copy of Fortune, you'll find in there one of the finest accounts of this society ever written. Well, why was it a fine account? It was a fine account because, in the first place, one of the editors of Fortune, himself an A.A., wrote it. That's one reason it's good. And I don't want his name printed in the press in this connection, but I'll give you a clue who it was. He's a fellow who a couple of years ago wrote the bestseller, put in the movies here, under the name of Mr. Blanding, Builds His Dream House. Do you get the pitch? And my friend there, he comes over to the office and says, Look, folks, uh, sure, I, I know something about AA, all right, to save my skin. I used to think Mr. Luce didn't know I was a rummy, but he did. He's asked me to do this job now. He knows I've been sober. But I need some help. Well, naturally, we turn the uh, office inside out for Harry. Boy, we pull in files, we give him panoramic pictures of AA, and he's the first writer who has emphasized our tradition as something very unique, also something quite American, so that the public has begun to be aware of this singular tradition of us in that wonderful piece. In other words, a lot of people took a lot of pains. We spent some of your money long distance telephoning to Eric home in Florida. We had long conversations with some of the people in Fortune. Manuscripts were passed back and forth. Fortune at first thought they only wanted a thousand words, and before they threw, they had it up to something around seven thousand words. You better read it. But that piece just didn't happen. Now, those chores have been done for you by some of us old-timers down in New York, plus those good secretaries and the grapevine editors, for years, I've invested almost the last ten years of my life in doing that sort of service for the whole of Alcoholics Anonymous. So now you have a situation where those friends of ours, that board of trustees, now control your money. They control your literature, your book, the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and that standard pamphlet literature. They look after your office of information, of mediation, and of propagation to distant lands. They control your principal monthly journal, the AA Grapevine, a mirror of this movement, current thought, getting more and more influential, 22,000 circulation. A very potent thing indeed on whose magic carpet you can travel from place to place in the mind's eye, and where our current experience is, cool, is, <coughs> is gathered. Your newspaper, your public relations, your thing, all under the control of a board of trustees that you fellas don't know from Adam. Ever stop to think about that? Well, I started thinking about it five years ago. And I got profoundly concerned. Because at that remote distance, I realized that when some of us old-timers had gone, who had been the link between those services and you, with that link broken, that place could fall down flat for the first time that a serious mistake was made. Those services could disappear and you couldn't reinstate them. 
Some fine morning you'd wake up and say, why didn't Smithy and Bill tell us? Why did they leave things in this shape? Why didn't they give us access to our own policy and our own business? Why didn't they give us charge of our main link to the world and to the millions who don't know? Why didn't they do this? So, of course, the great puzzle was, how could it be done? Knowing of our usual little business meetings and peanut politics operations, you could hardly conceive that delegates could be picked to go down there and sit with those trustees. A fine state of affairs to set this foundation on the base of 30 political rows a year. No, that wouldn't do. Somehow we would have to find a means of elevating our usual business and political operations into the area of statesmanship. And a couple hundred of us saw the proof of it this afternoon. It can be done. Sixty links can be forged to take the place of Smith and me to these services so vital to our future. I know you're going to do it. And I thank you. So leading to this step, before Smithy died, a pamphlet was prepared called The Third Legacy, meaning the legacy of service, with the aim to elevate service into the same level of respectability and participation as recovery and tradition, because service means recovery for the million who don't know. Service means that we can function. And in the pamphlet, we laid out a means by which this might be done on a trial basis. And Smithy and I prepared this in the form of a legacy. And in conclusion, I'm going to read you the first paragraph of that pamphlet which, because the foundation is a little hard up, we couldn't send everybody. It has not yet been widely circulated. And here, my friends, is your legacy. It goes like this. We, who are the older members of AA, bequeath to you who are younger these three legacies. The Twelve steps of recovery. The Twelve traditions. And now, the general services of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two of these legacies have long been in your keeping. By the 12 steps, we have recovered. By the 12 traditions, we are achieving a fine unity. Being someday perishable, Dr. Bob and I now wish to deliver <coughs> the members of Alcoholics Anonymous their third legacy. Since 1938, we and our friends have been holding it in trust. This legacy is the General Headquarters Services of AA, the Foundation, the AA Book, the Grapevine, and your General Office. These are the principal services which have enabled our society to function and to grow. Acting on behalf of all, Dr. Bob and I ask that you, the members of AA, assume guidance of these services and guard them well. The future growth, perhaps the very survival of Alcoholics Anonymous, may one day depend on how prudently these arms of service are administered in the years to come. Such, my friend, is your legacy of service. So now, as you see, our Cathedral of the Spirit is approaching completion in its general outline. Can you not see with me written large on its great floor our 12 steps of recovery? Have we not seen its side walls and arching roof go up? 
now buttressed by the AA tradition, which we trust will hold us in unity so long as God may need it. And do we not now perceive that the spire is being affixed upon our cathedral, and that the name of this spire shall be servant, a beacon to the million who don't yet know, and may its shining and symbolic finger always point straight upward toward God. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.